The Observer's Book of Weather, published in 1957. Chapter 1 Exploring into Space Those of us who were in southern England during the latter part of the last war have very unhappy memories of the V-2 rocket, which we still think of as a weapon of destruction only. But when the war ended, these rockets were turned to constructive use. They were sent up into the higher altitudes to collect valuable information about the atmosphere at those great heights beyond the reach of man. Indeed, they have now penetrated almost into outer space itself. Until about 1945, the highest altitude rock records obtained were from V-2 rockets in America, which penetrated up to about 450,000 feet. Recently, recording apparatus has been carried by these rockets to as high as 136 miles. This is the greatest advance in what is known as extraterrestrial terrestrial exploration. Formerly it was necessary to attach parachutes to these instruments to bring them back to earth, but these are no longer needed. These are no longer needed. Now radio transmitters are fitted into the rocket heads, and so readings of the instruments can be transmitted to observers on the ground while the rockets are soaring up into space. Before we start to study the weather over the lower levels of the Earth's surface, we should have some acquaintance with these higher regions of the atmosphere, which extend outward from the Earth's surface like a gaseous envelope to, so far as we know at present, a depth of about 200 miles. The two principal layers of which our atmosphere is composed are known as the stratosphere and the troposphere. The troposphere is the lower layer, which stretches from the Earth's surface to the beginning of the stratosphere. The latter varies in height in different parts of the world and according to prevailing weather conditions. It has its greatest altitude over the equator, where it is sometimes as high as 12 miles, and its lowest over the two poles where it has been known to be as low as six miles above the earth. We do not yet know how high the atmosphere actually extends, but it has been established that the limit of twilight, i.e. the point where the shadow of the earth which the sun casts on the sky, after passing below the horizon or before rising above it, is about 49 miles high, and that the observation of meteor trails suggests that atmosphere exists up to some 200 miles above the Earth. It is probable, however, that it stretches to even greater heights, as there must be some atmosphere to make the auroral streamers visible, and these have been measured to exceed 300 miles in altitude. Where space actually begins, such as we know space, devoid of all atmosphere, still remains to be solved. The way in which weather conditions in the troposphere affect the level of the stratosphere is when a storm of exceptional violence has the effect of lifting the stratosphere several miles higher than normal. Generally, however, very little weather is encountered more than about eight or nine miles above the earth, and there are very few clouds higher than seven miles. It will be understood, therefore, how the stratosphere, being free of complex weather conditions, is an ideal area for air travel. There are, however, certain dangers to air travel in the stratosphere, particularly from cosmic radiation. It has been found that the cosmic rays about 14 miles up are 150 times stronger than at Earth level, 
When cosmic rays reached such a force, they could crush to death both man and his machine. The stratosphere also protects our Earth from the bombardment of meteorites, and it is only very occasionally that one of these meteorites will break through this defence and hit the Earth. Even then, they are usually of a small variety, the only major one of the present century being the great meteor of 1908, which luckily struck an, un an uninhabited part of the Earth in the wastes of Siberia. If it had crashed through the stratosphere about four hours later, it would have wiped out entirely the whole city of Leningrad. It laid waste about 8,000 square kilometres of forest. The explosion was seen 275 miles away and the heat was felt for 40 miles. The atmosphere surrounding our Earth also protects us from the intense cold of the upper regions by acting as a kind of blanket that is able to retain the sun's heat. <laughs> it has only been possible to investigate these higher regions through recording the travel of sound waves from explosions that have reached such heights and then been reflected back to Earth by the rising temperature. The behaviour of the stratosphere as one ascends through these different spheres or layers is both interesting and surprising. We usually believe that temperature falls as height increases. This is generally the case in the troposphere and at the base of the stratosphere it is from 50 degrees to 100 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And this is a little note that was um, there was a star by cosmic radiation, so I'll read the little note that's below on page 4. Those who have made high ascents in balloons or aeroplanes have found that there is a radiation obviously generated in outer space and believed to be due to charged particles moving at very high velocities and which emits very penetrating rays. A tremendous amount of research into cosmic rays has been going on for many years and still continues as there is much more about these rays that scientists yet require to know. Back to the main body of the text on page 5. Contrary to what we would expect, it is much colder at that height over the tropics than over the temperate zone. So that's at the base of the stratosphere. About 10 miles up, a temperature Temperature of 133 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, 165 degrees of frost, has been recorded over the equator by an air pilot. But when we reach the stratosphere, a slower upward incline of temperature begins. At the ceiling of the stratosphere, about 125,000 feet, it is from 50 to 75 degrees warmer than at the base and it goes on rising up to about 160,000 feet, where the meso peak starts, and where temperatures of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit have been recorded. At that stage, a new decline starts, and the temperature falls steadily until the ceiling of the mesosphere, which is about 260,000 feet, is reached. This is probably the deepest minimum attained somewhere around 120 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. But from here upwards there is a steady rise, and it is believed that above these man-discovered heights, the temperature becomes excessively hot and may reach anything up to 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Apart from temperature, there are other observations of great interest in these difficult layers sorry, in these different layers above the Earth. One of these, which undoubtedly has an important bearing on our weather below, is the behaviour of the winds. Aircraft pilots occasionally encounter some quite alarming narrow belts of high-speed winds with velocities of nearly, nearly 300 miles per hour. Near the base of the stratosphere. Yeah, they, that's where they are, near the base of the stratosphere up to 300 miles per hour. 
They are sometimes hundreds of miles long and aircraft can make no headway at all against them. It has been noticed that they are strongest over the eastern side of the continents where continental air masses, referred to later in this chapter, meet maritime air masses of a different temperature. Generally, the wind strength increases as we ascend through the troposphere, owing to the fact that just below the stratosphere base there is an immense low-pressure area centred round the North Pole where the winds circulate anticlockwise. Clockwise, they are mainly westerly here, irrespective of what direction they are blowing at the Earth's surface. At a height of about 120,000 feet to 160,000 feet, the winds are westerly in winter and easterly in summer. In the ionosphere, easterly winds predominate in the lower region and westerly above about 400,000 feet. We have, of course, so far very little information about conditions in the ionosphere. The electrically charged layer in the atmosphere that plays such a large part in long-distance radio communication. It has been found, however, that at 60 miles up, there is a strongly ionized layer, ionized layer that reflects medium and long wireless waves. One other interesting series of observations has been made, and that is the changing of the sky colouring at different stages of an ascent. This data has been recorded by the American National Geographic Army Stratosphere Expedition. The observers noticed that the colour of the sky changed gradually from the familiar light blue to a dim purple and finally to a greyish black. The colours and other observations at different heights are shown on plate 1 and in figure 1. Research into these upper regions is going ahead continuously. The results may eventually reveal more fully the extent to which our weather in the lower layers is influenced by developments occurring aloft at impenetrable heights. So that's the end of chapter 1. I did the introduction um, in another little video. Um, which was quite a nice introduction to this book. So yeah, this book's from, uh, as I said, it's... Uh, well, sorry, actually, I, I think I got the date wrong. It's 1955. It was reprinted in 1962. <clears throat> so I thought there's some interesting bits there about... They're saying about these cosmic rays would crush, crush man and machine. And then they talk about the belief that... Uh, the belief that the temperature could go up to 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So when this book's been written and published, it's a little bit before what we're told were the, were the moon landings coming up, weren't they? I can't remember the date of those. Anyway, they were just a few, they were in the 60s, weren't they? I should have looked that up, but anyway, you can find out. But it's after this book was published, so what about these cosmic rays and what about the... 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Just makes you wonder, doesn't it? I don't know. Did they go up there? Who knows? Maybe the cosmic rays weren't so strong and maybe it didn't get up to 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But I've got doubts about the, the moon landings in the 60s. Um, I'm not convinced by the reporting or the pictures of them. But I'm, I'm not saying, I, I, obviously I don't know, but I've just, I just got doubts about it. Anyway, that's a little chapter from this book, which I found in a... I can't remember where I found it. A Tesco's, I think, at this free bookshelf, uh, bookshelf thing. The Observer's Book of Weather by Reginald M. Lester, FR Meteor Meteoric Society, published by Frederick Warren and Co., in 1955 so there we are a little bit of history I made a lot of mistakes reading that I suppose I could should record it all again but I don't know life's too short isn't it hopefully it was quite clear to listen to reasonably anyway not terrible 
lots of little mistakes anyway uh, to err is human to forgive is divine god bless you all bye bye